And now I want to introduce our speaker for this session, um, Dr. Christina Gibby. Uh, it's true that she's a lecturer for our humanities program, but she's also uh, the newest tenure track uh, faculty member in our program, and we're very lucky and happy to have her. Um, her interests include hemispheric American studies, specifically contemporary female authors from the Caribbean and the United States. And the title of her presentation is Our America, Transgressive Maps and Latin American Identity. Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my title comes from Cuban author Jose Martí's 1891 essay, Nuestra América, or Our America. And uh, Martí's essay is a call for Latin American unity at the close of a century marked by several wars for independence. At the time that Martí wrote this essay, all of Spain's colonies in the Americas, except for Cuba, his native land, and Puerto Rico, had won their independence. He encourages the newly independent American nations to reject ethnocentrism, or the idea that one's culture and one's history is the only one that matters. The essay's opening sentence highlights such arrogance. He begins his essay, the pompous villager thinks his hometown is the whole world. Marti calls for Latin Americans to reject this attitude and have a more relational view about each other and their shared space on the world stage. He says, those who once shook their fists at each other like jealous brothers, quarreling over who has the bigger house or who owns a plot of land, must now grip each other so tightly that their two hands become one. Although in 1891, Martí is living in exile from his native Cuba, he hopes for a liberated Latin America that will define itself on its own terms. Martí criticizes the newly independent Latin Americans who, quote, go out into the world wearing Yankee or French spectacles, hoping to govern a people they do not know, end quote. He argues that Latin Americans must see the world through a Latin American lens to really know their own country. Quote, the history of America from the Incas to the present must be taught in clear detail and to the letter even if the archons or rulers of Greece are overlooked. And here's his key point. Our Greece, and it reminds me of what Alex said about um, his island, right, the Mediterranean Islander. Our Greece must take priority over the Greece which is not ours, end quote. Marti's point is to question the utility of classical history in the face of unique contemporary American problems including the struggle for independence, something Martí literally gave his life for fighting in Cuba, and national identity. Quote, to know one's country and to govern it with that knowledge is the only way to free it from tyranny. He calls for Latin Americans to come out of the shadow of the United States and resist the cultural imperialism of the US and Europe to quote, clasp hands and become one, and to go forward in close ranks like silver in the veins of the Andes, end quote. Marti's concept of our America transgresses the expectation of what it means to be American. The US, he argues, does, does not have a monopoly on culture and civilization. Neither does it have the sole right to the name America. There are other Americas, but unfortunately these Americas are discounted as third world, or exoticized to the point of two-dimensional caricature. So, let me get to the next slide. 80 years after Martí published Nuestra América, Roberto Fernández Retemar, also Cuban, returns to the problem of Latin American identity in his 1971 essay, Caliban. And you can see the full title is clearly an allusion to Martí's Nuestra América. Fernandez Retemar begins his essay with a question posed to him by a European journalist. Does a Latin American culture exist? Fernandez Retemar writes that this, that this journalist's question could have been asked in another way. Do you exist? He continues, for to question our culture is to question our very existence, our human reality itself and thus to be willing to take a stand in favor of our irremediable colonial condition, since it suggests that we would be but a distorted echo 
of what occurs elsewhere. The artists I will talk about in this presentation, um, uh, let's see, assert their cultural identity and historicity by reimagining maps of the Americas. They play with and disrupt, in other words, transgress, the expectations of America to show that they are not distorted echoes of what occurs elsewhere. So why do these artists turn to maps as a way to talk about identity? It may seem like an unlikely choice, but cartography, or the process of map making, cannot be separated from religion, politics, ideology, and imperial desires. Jerry Broughton, a professor at Queen Mary University of London, explains, all cultures have always believed that the map they valorize is real and true and objective and transparent, when re really all maps are always subjective. So I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of maps first that will contextualize uh, Western cartography and to emphasize this uh, European Western ethnocentrism. But I want to say, of course, as Broughton says, that um, all cultures do this, where they make their, their nation, their continent larger than every, everyone else. But for um, the context of this, this um, presentation, I'm going to be focusing on Western cartography and specifically um, the Europe and the United States in the way that they are illustrated. So this map is from 1300, and it's a great example of maps as ideological tools. It's a European Christian medieval map that's actually more interested in bibl biblical time than literal space. You'll notice that, I'll show you here, the Garden of Eden is positioned at the top of this map. And then at the center, we have Jerusalem indicated with uh, a cross. To the right is Africa, and then on its coast are these monstrous beings to show um, the limits of their knowledge and what is out in the darkness of the unknown, which they imagine to be um, monstrous and uh, people against nature. So this map may be extremely disorienting for you, especially if you are accustomed to seeing the map with north at the top, which I'm assuming most of you are and east to the right. There's another map from uh, 1493 that shows mo uh, monsters in the margins to again emphasize the limits of their knowledge and what is outside in that dark space. So this map reflects European anxieties about the unknown while reaffirming Europe as the apex of culture and civilization. The next map is from 1507, and this map is known as America's birth certificate because um, it's in the early 1500s that they realize the Americas is, is a, a quote unquote new world. And so um, this map also emphasizes how in the West, cartography from the Renaissance and beyond often illustrates Europe at the center of the map, as it does here. These kinds of maps also depict North at the top illustrating an implicit hierarchy, um, whereas the North is often, even to this day, equated with civilization and culture, whereas the South, at the bottom of the world, is associated with the third world. The map that you are most likely familiar with is based on uh, the Mercator projection from uh, this map from 1569 which has been often criticized for compressing Africa and South America and strategically placing or centering and enlarging Europe and North America. But again, I want to quote Broughton who says, no map is any better or worse than any other map. It's just about what agenda it pursues. Whereas Western maps reinforce the implicit cultural superiority of the Northern Hemisphere, America Invertida by Uruguayan artist Joaquin Torres Garcia directly challenges that bias. This transgressive map situates South America as if it were at the top of the world. It depicts South America not in relation to the US or Europe as periphery to the center, but on its, on its own terms. This drawing indicates Torres Garcia's desire that Latin America not be considered derivative, merely a distorted echo. 
In this map, Uruguay is at the center. He situates his culture at the center of the world. This map is a physical representation of Torres Garcia's uh, declaration in his 1935 manifesto, The School of the South. And in this manifesto, he declares, our North is the South. He says, there should be no North for us, except in opposition to our South. That is why we now turn the map upside down. And now we know what our true position is. And it is not the way the rest of the world would like to have it. From now on, the elongated tip of South America will point incessantly at the South, our North. Our compass as well. It will incline irremediable, irremediably and forever toward the South, toward our pole. When ships sail from here traveling North, they will be traveling down, not up, as before. Because the North is now below. And as we face our South, the East is to the left. This is a necessary rectification, so that now we know where we are. This South-oriented position is emphasized by his artistic style that draws from pre-Columbian forms and traditions, rather than imitating modern art produced in the artistic centers of New York City and Paris. America Invertida illustrates this desire to um, draw from local inspiration, specifically pre-Columbian inspirations, as you can see with the pictogram of the sun, um, which is a very important pre-Columbian symbol, but also the moon, the constellations, and um, the fish. These kinds of pictograms, symbols, that uh, appeared in an earlier work of, hi of his, which is uh, a relief sculpture titled Cosmic Monument. It's a, a modern piece from the 30s. However, it's reminiscent of pre-Columbian monuments, like the Gate of the Sun in Bolivia, which is over on the, the right side there. Cosmic Monument is a fulfillment of Jose Marti's wish for Latin Americans to know their own history and to value it more than the history of Europe. Like Marti said, um, our Greece should matter more than the original Greece, right? Um, to find themselves within their history. Chilean-born artist Alfredo Jar likewise challenges the accepted, accepted northern bias, specifically through the concept of Amer America and to whom that term applies. Jar's us versus them, sorry, us and them, uh, is a conceptual piece that attempts to show that the, quote, widening gap between us and them, or the third world and the first, is only a mental one, end quote. And so you can probably see by looking at this uh, collection of images that it's the same image of um, the White House that's repeated over and over again with different words, uh, text that's printed under, above, and across the image of the White House. And so the White House is a, a symbol of America, right? A symbol of the United States. And so here Jar is playing with that concept of what America is and who gets to... Um, who gets the sole claim to that term, America. So some of the text includes, our America is our America. Our, their, us, and them. And I have a close up with this image that says, our, uh, America minus America equals South America. Or in other words, our America minus their America equals us. One of his first public uh, pieces was a logo for America from 1987. Um, this was a, a 45 second video installation in Times Square in Manhattan. And in this piece, Jar imitates commercial advertising to make a political statement to subvert the Norse implied superiority. And so um, looking at these images, I can assume that already of you probably a, a Already a couple of you are probably getting uncomfortable, right? Because this idea of showing the map of the United States and then saying, this is not America, right? But I want to clarify that he's, he's not saying the United States is evil or the United States is bad. He's just making this point that it's not the only America, right? And so coming back to Marti's point about um, the villager who thinks that his hometown is the whole world. Um, Jar wants to make this, this point that there's a whole hemisphere that should not be erased, right? 
important that we should be aware of. So I'm going to play this uh, clip for you, and then we'll talk about the um, the reactions to it by uh, people from the United States in Times Square as they're watching this this video clip. So as you can imagine, <laughs> there were a lot, of, a lot of Americans, right, people from the U.S. who were really upset by this message. And so NPR uh, journalists were on the ground interviewing people in Times Square who said live on national radio, this is illegal. How could they let, them, let him do this? And so as Jar explains, it is so embedded in their education that the U.S. is America, whereas the rest of the continent is erased. The geopolitical reality is that this country, the U.S., dominates the entire hemisphere. This was a very controversial work, but it's also Jar's most uh, reproduced work, which I think is very interesting. Uh, the final artist that I'll show you who uses maps to comment on Latin American identity is Argentina's Horacio Zabala. Uh, Zabala is another very conceptual artist, like Jar, um, who distorts maps specifically of, um, of South America and Argentina in order to reflect Argentina's socio-political turmoil under a repressive military government. His works illustrate that socio-political realities are not as stable as they appear on maps. This is a great example of that. Deformations are, propor are proportional to tensions. And so to give you some context that this piece is from 1972, um, uh, you might be familiar with Argentina's Dirty War, which will begin in 1976. Uh, but the, the history of Latin America is a very turbulent and violent one, especially in the 20th century, and especially in Argentina during the decades of the 50s and 60s with uh, various coup d'etats. And um, then in 1972, when uh, Zabala is working on these pieces I'm going to show you, um, there is a, a, it's being ruled by a military government, so just to keep that in mind. Um, let me show you a couple of other images. This is um, dealing with the idea of uh, fragmentation. And what's really interesting here is that Zabala quotes from the Greek philosopher Heraclitus about um, a, a quote about fire and eternal fire. This world order, cosmos, uh, the same of all, no God nor man did create, but it ever was and is and will be ever living fire, kindling in measures and being quenched in measures. And so it's very clear here that Zabala is commenting on the political instability of, of his country, but also the political instability of South, South America, Latin America as a whole, especially during the 20th century. And so you can see here how he has... Um, an interesting layered map of South America um, with the layers of smaller pieces, smaller and smaller pieces of this map that has been singed by fire. And so the fire alluding to, um, to violence, to wars, to destruction, ultimately to that political inst instability. And the next image is <clears throat> Uh, from this series, and here you can see how he's taken the map of South America and um, the, the, uh, the fire, the burns are getting larger and larger and larger until they encompass all of South America, essentially erasing South America because of all this violence and uh, political instability. There's another piece that also emphasizes um, fire, destruction, violence, but then you can see it within the whole, the, con the, the whole context of the world map. The next one, um, unknown land. He does some interesting things here conceptually. 
Uh, it reminds me of the Bermuda Triangle, right? You have this triangle that he's drawn over Argentina, uh, sorry, not Argentina, South America as a whole, right? And then to show how it's blacked out, that it is um, more or less erased. This is pretty similar to the first uh, piece of his that I showed to you that emphasizes deformations to reflect the distorted and nightmarish reality that South Americans are, are living through in the 20th century. And then here we have um, revisar or to revise, to change, right? And then um, censoring. So he's taken these maps with the words revisar and censurar and has covered South America with these stamps, right? So there's something um, bureaucratic about that. This uh, commentary on, on bureaucratic governments and these stamps, these rubber stamps, where they can erase this uh, all of South America and the experience of uh, South Americans. It's a, a pretty specific commentary on the repression uh, and violation of human rights in the region. And then I have one more piece of his to show you. Well, I guess there's four different parts here. But this one I think is so fascinating because you can see how um, in the top left corner over South America, he's taken a map of the United States, of North America, of the United States and Canada and Alaska, and has repositioned it so that it lines up with the tail end of uh, Central America to reach, to, to connect to Alaska. Um, and so I think that's a pretty obvious commentary and statement about how North America, as in many ways the apex of culture and civilization, has eclipsed South America. Uh, same thing with the one on the right. And then over here again, the rubber stamp of uh, revisado. So at this point, now it is, it is revised. And then this one, which I think is just so haunting, it says, if South America never existed, did not ex doesn't exist, and it's been swallowed up um, by the sea. So now it's a void, an emptiness. Its placement at the bottom of the world makes it so that it doesn't exist to the rest of the world. Zabala's works and those of the other two artists prefigure Colombian author Gab uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez um, and his Nobel lecture in which he asserts that, quote, Latin America neither wants nor has any reason to be a pawn without a will of its own. Near, nor is it merely wishful thinking that its quest for independence and originality should become a Western aspiration. As he says, it is only natural that they insist on measuring us with the yardstick that they use for themselves, forgetting that the ravages of life are not, this, are not the same for all and that the quest for our own identity is just as arduous and bloody for us as it was for them. The interpretation of our reality through patterns not our own serves only to make us more, ever more unknown, ever less free, ever more solitary. So like Marti before him, Garcia Marquez argues for the possibility of a uniquely Latin American identity, not defined by Northern expectations, his Nobel lecture echo echoes the transgressive maps of Torres Garcia, Jar, and Zabala, who model a quest for Latin American identity not in relation to the US or Europe as peripheral spaces on Western maps, but on their own terms to know what their true position is. Thank you. Testing. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I create maps in my workplace, and I just was wondering how can I prioritize finding or creating data that is unbiased? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm looking at it more from cultural studies and art history, and so I don't have the information for you, but I'd love to talk more about that and help you to find 
um, ha information on how to get the data to reflect um, it without a bias. I think that's great. What do you do for work? Um, I work at a civil engineering company right okay. now. I do mostly environmental work. Yeah. But I've noticed that even though it's not necessarily social or cultural studies, mm -hmm. um, sometimes we can have biased data, even environmental stuff and issues. Yes, yes. Um, there's someone in um, geography that I can put you in touch with, and they would be able to help you more with that practical application. Great. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hi, I was wondering what you think we can do as individuals to help represent better yeah. or less forgetting, I guess. Yeah, I think that's great. And that's something that's um, even difficult for me because I'll slip and refer to myself as American or talk about U.S. stuff as American. And so that's something that um, I strive to to specify U.S. literature rather than American literature. So going back to language and the significance of our, our language and creating a reality, and if our language erases an entire reality, right, I think that's something to be aware of. I'll share an anecdote. Um, when I was uh, doing a study abroad in Spain, I was at a restaurant, and the server asked me where I was from, and um, I said, you know, um, the United States, and then he said, oh, I'm American too, and I looked at him, and I was really confused, because his Spanish was, he didn't have an American accent, right, and then he explained that he was from Argentina, and so that just, you know, reiterate, it reaffirmed for me this idea of being American as hemispheric, rather than just the United States, so I think there's something about um, the way that we use our language, and s specifying U.S., and not ignoring also the Caribbean as American, right, um, and South America as well, as, as all the Americas. So I, this is a great question. Hi, Christina. This summer I read a really disturbing book called The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. And she writes about um, disaster capitalism, which is advocated by Milton Freeman and his school of Chicago School of Economics, which argues that this school actually uses and exploits the instability in South America for its own ends. And I was just wondering, since she, since she writes about this time that Zabala was mm -hmm. producing art mm -hmm. about how... Uh, the deformities are proportional to tensions in mm -hmm. 1972. I wondered if you've, in your work, if you've discovered any connection between Zabala and the disaster capitalists that were operating in his area mm. of South America. Um, not specifically, but what comes to mind is uh, Garcia Marquez's quote, that uh, Latin America does not want to be a pawn, that does not want to have, that wants to have a will of its own. And something that, I didn't include in the uh, the presentation because I w it was tangential, but I, I can bring it in now, um, was just to discuss Latin Americans' involvement in the Cold War. And so the Cold War, why it's cold, but there were all these proxy wars that were taking place all across the globe, and how Latin America was part of that international chessboard. And so these, these proxy wars, but also these silent wars where the CIA is involved in these military coups to remove um, el elected officials from power and then putting in uh, dictators that um, have U.S. interests in, at heart, which is to stop the spread of communism. And so we could, we could talk more about that and the, the pros and cons, but South America sees that as definitely as, as cons, right, taking away their liberty and their ability to elect whomever they want to elect, right? And so there's something about that contested space of South America and all the, um, the coups and the military dictator dictatorships that are being into put into place, uh, specifically in Guatemala, to, to protect U.S. corporate interests. And so we have um, banana republics and, and all of that. So, yeah, it, it's the idea of Latin America being part of this chessboard and being pawns on this chessboard um, in these proxy wars during the Cold War and not having a voice of its own and not being able to uh, show and represent the turmoil that, it, that it's going through, right? So that's, that's an important point to bring up as well. Okay. So 
I've done some research <laughs> on uh, the, especially the Latin American uh, gangs in California. Uh, a lot of people don't know they started because they exploited black people the whole time. But now they've, they've taken hold of a lot of areas in South America. And, and do you see any potential solutions to, or some ways to resolve that situation? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's like world peace, right? Um, uh, that's a great question. I'm sure, well, do you have any responses to that? Do you have any thoughts about um, solutions for that? I think there's something with a, the, an earlier question about representation that's important and language. And then, of course, I think education and having a way out of, of, um, of gang life specifically. Um, I'm thinking about uh, from my, I'm going to say my limited knowledge of gang life, but specifically targeting adolescent men who don't have the right kind of role models and who don't have a, a clear path for their future. Um, I think that's, that's the problem that I can identify, but I don't know how to, <laughs> how to solve that. I'm, but I'm open to having a discussion about it, if any of you want to comment on that. Yeah, Caitlin, does your question go along? Yeah, I kind of had a similar question. I think yeah. it's a little bit related, but I just feel like a lot of these authors and artists um, are kind of like, pointing out a lack of identity and a lack of um, knowledge about history in Latin Americans. And they're kind of calling them to action to learn about their history and, mm -hmm. and see themselves as Americans. And so I was just wondering if you felt like there was any maybe institutionalized thing that happened or some like social or historical event that has led to like a lack of identity or a lack of awareness in Latin Americans. Mm -hmm. And maybe like, you know, I guess, imperialism, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so that's excellent, Caitlin. I think specifically with slavery, um, which wasn't just in the United States, right? And the United States wasn't the only location that had the plantation slavery, but also in all of the Americas, including the Caribbean. And so th the problem with the, the slave trade and the Middle Passage is that it is a, a rupture of history, right? And so the need to reclaim that that history and fill in the, the void, that's something that's so important to do. And so a lot of these intellectuals and artists, they say that creation is the way to do that. Um, Octavio Paz writes about the nightmare of history and how the greatness of man lies within our ability to face that nightmare and confront it and to create something new out of it. Um, and so just as uh, there's a really well-known uh, conductor, I'm for, I wish I could remember his name. Um, and this goes along with Wendell's question as well. And I believe he's in Venezuela. And he is, if anyone knows who I'm talking about, you remember his name, that's great. But this Venezuelan con conductor who does a youth orchestra. And so all of these youths that he's been able to get into the arts and off the streets and into um, creating something and representing their own culture, I think that's a great example of solution, something that's active and something that's not necessarily uh, political in the traditional sense, but I guess we could say that any, everything's political, right? But uh, through the arts and that creative ability and to find pride in what you do and who you are and how you represent that as well. And I'm sorry that I'm not for remembering his name. Yes, it's Dudamel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they, there's one of my favorite uh, videos is uh, them doing Bernstein's West Side Story Mambo, and it's really exciting to see. Um, yeah. Matt, do you have a question? Sort of um, combining two thoughts into, I'm going to try to make it one question. Um, I guess, do you think that this ethnocentric view of um, the Northern Hemisphere of America has shifted so that now it's kind of more inclusive of South America? And if so, do you feel that these works, such as that by Zabala, has helped to influence that? Mm. Yeah, uh, I want to say hopefully to your first question, yes. I, I think especially with um, the, <laughs> I sound so old, the younger generation, I see that just awareness of um, other people and how the uh, younger generation is 
aware of their context within the rest of the world as well. I think that's a really good point. Um, and then to your second question, I'm not so sure. Sadly, unfortunately, I, I don't think so. Because these artists, I only found as I was doing research to teach a class on Latin American uh, humanities. And I thought that I already knew a lot about a la Latin American humanities. And then I find these artists, and I had never heard of them before. I'd never seen their work before. Um, and I was especially uh, you know, impacted by JAR's logo for America. Be especially because it's such a controversial thing. And I was wondering why I had never seen it before, never heard of it before. So I think there is still some work to be done just to let um, US students be aware of this. But that's something that the humanities program does really well in 1010, especially the 101G course with the global emphasis and introducing students to classes that are, that are different from their own you know, heritage and, and traditions and, and understanding of the world. So I, again, I come back to education and just to, to read as much as you can and to be, a world, to be aware of the larger world outside of your, your own village. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening.